You just wrote um, a, a article on the uh, Kane trial wrap up, and the uh, title to your article was Kathleen Kane's Jury's Trial Rigged. And basically, your premise was that a series of pre trial decisions rendered against Kane in the weeks and months before leading to the jury verdict helped to seal her fate long before a jury was selected. And I've had you on before, and we've talked about this before, because I'm not a big fan of Kathleen Kane, but I'm also not a huge fan of the process. Um, that resulted in her conviction. I got to be honest with you. And, um, she was convicted, although uh, I'm not. I, I don't want to make light of it, but um, leaking grand jury information is, is like political jaywalking. Uh, in Pennsylvania politics, uh, but it's against the law, and she was convicted. It, it's interesting to me. I just observe um, the avalanche of outrage that was directed against her, and the absolute silence after Barbara Hafer was essentially caught. Uh, paying to play, but that, that's a story for a different day. But look, in the first five minutes before we go to break, why, why don't you walk us through the background? Because it's been now, it's almost four years with Kathleen Kane. How did we get to where we're at? Well, my God, I, you know, any, anybody that's been following state politics knows it's, it started with the Sandusky case when she was running for attorney general. And, you know, again, she was inexperienced. She said, I will uh, reveal any any politics I find in the case. She should have just said, I'll look into the case, because right. there's not a file cabinet that says, you know, that Tom Corbett was keeping here are my political interferences. Right. What she, what she should have just done was said, we'll look into the case and report back if we find anything. And what were the prosecutors doing, the listeners know? Well, they were sending pornographic emails to the judges in this state and to the police officers. That's what they were doing for years while they should have been going after Jerry Sandusky. So that obviously set up a firestorm. But, you know, your listeners will know that we've had two state Supreme Court justices resign for sharing pornographic emails. <clears throat> and it's just not that the emails are distasteful or pornographic. It shows how the, the judges are in bed with the prosecutors and the police, you know. If, but I think, Bill, that's what's been missed. So let's say if, if, if the information shared wasn't pornographic and wasn't offensive, the right. thing that I've always taken umbrage is should – these are ex-party communications. Should judges, prosecutors, and defenders be on the same email chain? Well, yeah. I mean, when you go to court, I think you'd like to know – that the judge sitting on your fate isn't a good old boy yucking it up with the prosecutor and the cops on your case. So that's very serious, and this isn't make-believe. Again, we've had two justices resign. There's supposedly two other justices implicated in receiving the emails. Suffice it to say, these guys were hopping mad at Kathleen Kane. So, you know, we can get back to what Kane did wrong here. You know, she never should have leaked grand jury material. But, right. but uh, you know, she basically made the club that they beat her with. Right. And, and you know, going back two years now, it, it was no secret that what the intent here was, was to, to find her guilty of this and to drive her out of office. And here we are. But let me just ask you this, because, you know, before we get into the, the nuts and bolts of the case, because what we're going to discuss today, a lot of people just don't get uh, in terms of mainstream media coverage. And, and, and you know, I think our listeners are, are, are fairly wary of the mainstream, and certainly they're, they're, they're probably not aware of the role of the Philadelphia Daily News. Right. But, but have you ever seen anybody fall like Kathleen Kane has fought. I mean, what a dramatic uh, meteoric rise. And, and then just a, a it's like a crash and burn because she was supposed to be the candidate running for Senate uh, against Pat Toomey right now. I mean, you're a political observer. You've written numerous books. Have you seen anybody rise that quickly and fall so swiftly? Oh, not to my knowledge. And, you know, what What really struck you when you sat through the trial and, and you heard the testimony of her well, Now, just remind people, were you actually at the trial? Yeah, I sat through the whole thing for 10 days. It was, it was, it was a, a wearying experience, let me put it that way. <laughs> but, but, you know, she, um, she uh, uh, what was your question? 
I'm sorry. No, no, I, I just want to get back. We're going to get back to this after the break. You know, we, you and I go back almost 40 years now, and I haven't seen so many, so, some, somebody with so much potential promise, although, yeah. you know, she really was not cut out for the job. She didn't have the experience. And that's that, that doesn't justify the way the prosecution took place. But I can't recall somebody who was as red hot politically as she was and who was basically going to be anointed the next senator yeah. just crash and burn like she did. So let's do this because we're, we're at break, and I apologize because I, I needed to take other calls on the other issue. When we return, let's just go through the Kane trial. Most people are probably unaware of a lot of the details and the logistics that led to her conviction. Eric Epstein in for Ken Matthews. When we come back, we got about an hour with Bill Keesley. We're going to go through the uh, Kane trial. Uh, see you in just a moment. Eric Epstein, back with Bill Kiesling. Uh, I've known Bill for almost 40 years, dating back to Three Mile Island. He's written extensively on it and everything from Bud Dwyer to the Turnpike Commission. And, and he's just written an article basically on um, was a Kathleen Kane jury rigged. Uh, and, and, and Bill, by the way, because you've written voluminously and, and I don't have the time to go over it, where can people access um, your articles and your books? Well, my website is yardbird.com. Right. People might know about it. The, the, I covered the trial for Newslank out of Lancaster, right. which is Newslank, L-A-N-C. And you can see the article where I talk about the background to the trial. Well, and, before getting to the – that, that's what I want to do. Before getting to the trial, one of the things in your article, you, you, you basically start out, you know, using the Merriam-Webster's dictionary definition of what a show trial is. And um, why don't you walk us through why you think the trial was rigged from the outset? Well, I mean, everything about it. Um, uh, I mean, and you can even, you know, I'm used, why was this trial scheduled to start August 8th or 9th when everyone was away on vacation? Obviously, a political trial like this after Labor Day would have garnered much more public attention, right? right. I think people would have been tuned in on it. So how many people weren't even paying attention to what was going on in, in Norristown? But b before I get to the trial, let, let me just make an important point, because you, you asked the question, had I ever seen anything like this with Kane? And I think this goes to the Citizen United decision, because what came out at the trial with her political consultant, Kane's political consultant, was that even she had self-financed her campaign. Her mm -hmm. husband was wealthy. He owned that trucking firm up in Scranton, Kane. Mm -hmm. and, and, um, but when she got into trouble... She had no real grassroots support, and that's what she was trying to garner. Mm -hmm. But so that's really kind of interest. You know, it's an interesting thing to think about how somebody can self-finance, get into office, but really have very little grassroots support because of all the money that's been poured into it. Well, I, I think I mean the polling supported. She she had about a twenty-five percent favorability, and she had a strong base, especially from women and some Democrats. But it, it, it got to the point where her position became untenable, you know, and a lot of it was self-inflicted wounds, absent sure. this. But this does not mean she wasn't entitled to a fair trial. Right. And one of the things that you, you, you got length to point out was, you know, the pretrial publicity right. and, and some of the pretrial decisions. So maybe you can walk our viewers through some of the pretrial decisions that occurred, because as an as a, as a observer, you're, you're going to miss it unless somebody gives you the pay, play by play. Right. Well, I mean, these are separate issues, and they're also important legal issues, pretrial publicity, plus also the motions she put in to have a fair trial that were totally ignored in the, in the, in the weeks and months leading to the trial. The, the bellwether case for pretrial publicity, your readers might know, was called Shepard v. Maxwell. It was Sam Shepard, who oh. later became the basis of The Fugitive. Right. And, you know, believe it or not, what got Sam Shepard out of prison wasn't they didn't find the one-armed man like in, in the fugitive? It was pre-trial publicity, and this went back to a day in the 1950s when, and you can still see it in old movies when newspaper reporters would be flashing their cameras right in the defendant's face in the courtroom. Mm -hmm. um, the jury pool was affected, and and basically that created uh, a, a, a bellwether case, Shepard v. Maxwell, that eliminated a lot of the stuff that went on in the 50s and 60s. Now, the question is, what sort of pretrial publicity did, was Kane victim of? And it, it was different than the Shepard case because the judge was careful to tell the jury not to listen to the radio. All of these things that affected Shepard weren't necessarily at play with her, mm -hmm. but instead, as, as all the listeners know, we had 
almost two years of run-up to the trial where she was her law license was suspended. The, the state Supreme Court, which was up to their eyeballs and all this with the porno emails, said that they couldn't remove her from office, but the legislature could. Then we had all this stuff about the Senate a, a direct address to remove her. Well, let me ask you this. Bill, we'll just go back. I, I guess what I'm trying to wonder, how do you how do you take somebody's law license before they're convicted of a crime? Well, isn't that a good question? And I, know, I, it just always I, it always startled me that she was accused of committing a crime. OK, yes, she's been convicted of it now. But it was I believe it was a unanimous decision by a Supreme Court in which two of the people that made the decision were later removed for participating in the emails. Right. Okay. And if, if, if you remember, there was a, there was a supposed several investigation of these justices where, where they were exonerated. You know, the court investigated itself and said, oh, these guys didn't do anything wrong, and then more stuff came out, and they were forced to resign. Well, but just so our listeners understand, so the Supreme Court never had the ability to remove Kathleen Kane from office. The only thing they had the ability to do was to deprive her of a law license. Well, and also uh, to give her a fair trial. Right. Because, you know, one of the things she said was the investigation of her for these leaks was done by the courts. And, and that was done under the precedent that Justice Castile set with that whole Lewis de Naples case here in Dauphin County a few years back, right. where, where they actually appointed their own special prosecutor. And, you know, at the time, if you remember, everyone thought this was basically just a warning shot across the bow of all these reporters. You know, nobody was charged. De Naples got off. But it became this precedent that the court itself could appoint a special prosecutor. Uh, you know, I just make the point that the court has no business being in the prosecution business. Mm -hmm. They're supposed to be fair and impartial jurists. And I make the second point that in Pennsylvania, our courts can't even investigate themselves, as, as we saw with the case with these two justices. So, so now they're going to be appointing a prosecutor to go after other people. Well, That's I mean, if, if, if you back up to the when, when Kathleen Kane was elected, she had a lot of support. And perhaps her largest and most vocal and most consistent supporter was the Philadelphia media. And, you know, one of the people involved in this case, and perhaps you can walk our audience through this again, I hate to keep saying walk our audience through it because I had to be walked through it, is the role of Chris Bennett, Brennan of the Philadelphia Daily News. Yeah, well, I think as your reporters know, there's this thing that reporters are supposed to do, which is called protect your confidential informant. Right. So, I mean, leading up to the trial, it wasn't clear how Brennan got this story. Was he saying that this just came over the transom anonymously? In other words, was it sent by someone he didn't know so he didn't have to protect somebody? No. I mean, what came out of the trial, Kane's political consultant, Josh Morrow, said, he got this stuff, and he worked as a confidential source. Well, what stuff? Brennan, yeah, because you're moving fast. Josh Morrow, who's a consultant, came. What stuff did he get? Excuse me. What, what stuff did Josh Morrow get? I, I, I'm not really sure. I know who Josh Morrow is. I doubt the listeners know. All right. Well, there was an envelope full of grand jury material. So what the trial came down to was how was this material gathered in Kane's office? And then it was kind of, uh, you know, trace, trace the transportation of this envelope, and it went through apparently Adrian King, mm -hmm. who was Kane's first deputy, also former uh, chief. Of, he was former chief of staff, I think, for Rendell. Right. Well, yeah. deputy chief of staff, and mm -hmm. he's the brother-in-law of John Esty, who just went down for stealing thirteen thousand bucks from an FBI sting while he was a counsel for the Hershey Trust. Yeah, the Thanksgiving ought to be interesting at their house. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, but anyway, what Morrow says was he got a call one night from Kane saying that they had some material and Adrian King was going to call him. He gets a call from Adrian King who says he's leaving town in the morning and they decide to put this envelope in the storm door, in Adrian King's storm door. And, and he was told to redact names, every name but Frank Fina and, and another prosecutor. Mm -hmm. So he says he did it, he waited some time. He actually got on the phone and complained to another prosecutor, another consultant who was being bugged by the FBI, and they go on about it, and he says that, that uh, King has told him to redact names. That's on the FBI wiretap. So um, what he does is he, he waits a little bit, he redacts the names, and then he calls Chris Brennan and actually takes the envelope to him at his house.
Well, so, did you, you just stop. Again. You're moving quick for me. So basically, the consultant Duquesne gave the information to her her chief of staff. The chief of staff then wound up personally taking it to the media. Well, it, that's kind of backwards. It's not clear. What Adrian King, her chief of staff, says is the envelope is just sitting in his office. Hmm. And he, he didn't know what the contents were. He took it down to Josh Morrow. And so there was never a direct handoff from from Kane to Morrow. King is kind of in the middle of it. King says he had no idea what was in the envelope or, you know, that it was grand jury material. Hmm. All right, let's do so, this. let's take a break because this is a little more in depth than I thought, and it's actually better than a Ludlum novel. Uh, unfortunately, we know how it's going to end. Eric Epstein in for Ken Matthews today. The number is five four zero zero five eight zero. We're going to let Bill Keesling, who covered the Kane trial, um, basically go over the trial until about five, then open the phones. Uh, Bill, hang in there. We'll be back in just a moment. All right, Bill, we're back with you. Um, let me ask you a couple pointed questions, because there are things, and I'm sure listeners probably have the, the, the same question. Why was this trial against Kathleen Kane in Montgomery County? Well, on the face of it, it was because that's where the grand jury investigation started. Remember, we were saying that the court appointed a special prosecutor, this fellow by the name of Carluccio, whose wife is a judge in Montgomery County. So it started there. And, and, and we can, we'll get into that quickly, but that was one of the things that Kane asked for, a change of venue. And she also asked for all the judges of Montgomery County to be recused. And, you know, that seems like a very small request. If you're going to have a fair trial, for God's sakes, put it somewhere else mm -hmm. and bring in some judges that aren't married or socializing with the people who are investigating this, mm -hmm. you know? So, but... You raise an important point about Chris Brennan mm -hmm. and the envelope. Uh, Chris Brennan, the reporter for the Daily News. And the envelope is something writers would call a MacGuffin. It's like uh, uh, the Maltese Falcon. It's, it's just to move the plot along. The real question is, what did Brennan do when he got the envelope? A good reporter would protect his sources. A great reporter... You are never even going to know what his sources were or what he's reading. Mm -hmm. the, the, the really good case to read is all the president's men with by Woodward and Bernstein about Watergate. They had a fellow by the name of Mark Felt, who was the associate director of the FBI. Right. He was known as Deep Throat. And what he told them was, you can't quote me directly. I just want to be a roadmap mm -hmm. for your story. And they never, they obviously protected Mark Felt for decades. Yeah, I, just, I think Mark Felt was the one who disclosed Mark Felt. Yeah, and, and so in this case, though, what Chris Brennan does, intentionally or not, he picks up the phone to Frank Fina, of all people, and reads verbatim this grand jury material. It's like waving a red flag in front of a bull. Right, you now, Fina and Kane are, are pretty, we're, well, I'm sure are, we're, we're pretty much locked in uh, heated political war. Right. So the idea is Brennan certainly should have known about that. In my own experience, I was given anyone who knows my book about the turnpike, when the levy breaks, I received this big packet of information before that book happened. And I never called up the turnpike directors and read verbatim. I didn't even let them know I had that. Right. That becomes a roadmap for you to go and verify the story by your own devices to protect your sources. That's how a great reporter works. You'll never even know that there was a source or a leak. Well, no, no, no. So, so people remember, Fina was, uh, was the main prosecutor in the Sandusky case, if I recall. Right. Uh, and he was, and, and apparently he figures in the pornographic email scandal, and he just left Philadelphia District Attorney's office. Uh, you know, Seth Williams, the DA down there, let him go after all the uh, upset with his involvement in the pornographic emails, apparently. Well, well, this, this is the thing that, that, that kind of I, I thought was absolutely bizarre, is that during the grand jury proceedings against Kane, and she's accused of leaking grand jury material, right. weren't grand jury materials being leaked when they were investigating her? Yeah, I mean, they were, they were leaking every step of the way. It was coming down what people were saying. It, it, that, that FBI wiretap was leaked to the Allentown call before it happened, so somebody was leaking FBI materials. You know, I mean, let's, let's, and, and that's just the Kane case. Let's forget about all the other cases, like the Sandusky case. Just yesterday, Frank Fina was up testifying in a Sandusky hearing about all the leaks in the Sandusky case. Right. And then we can, then we can get into the whole, uh, uh, what was that case with Mike Vian and DeWeese? The, you, you know, well, all I, that's 
Yeah, yeah, I think with those guys, before before confusing folks, I want to stay back with, with this case, because people ass assumed that she was guilty. People assumed that she was going to get convicted. Nobody really paid attention to the process or protocol. So now you sat through the 10 days of, 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 the, of the trial of, of Kane. Was there any doubt in your mind from the outset that she was going to be convicted? Well, it didn't look so bad for her until, until her former consultant, Josh Morrow, got on the stand. And only the day before, the judge had granted him immunity. So he had gone for two years saying Kane had nothing to do with this. She, you know, she, she, she had broken no laws. And, and then in the middle of the trial on the Thursday, he gets on the stand and said he'd been lying for two years. He's just been given immunity by the judge the day before. And, and Kane is part, he says, of a conspiracy to leak it. That was devastating to her. All right, well, let's do this. Let's come back. We're going to open the phones. We have you until about 530. I think it's important people get a comprehensive view of the trial. A lot of this stuff was abs it's still new to me, and I'm trying to, trying to get through it. And I'm concerned about the sanctity of the system and the process. Regardless of how you feel about Kathleen Kane, she deserved a fair trial. All right, we're back. Uh, Eric Epstein in for Ken Matthews. I want to thank Ken for giving me the opportunity to host the show. Also, RJ, JC for producing me, everybody at WHP for putting up with what they refer to as, quote, unquote, the diva, which I am. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> our number is 540 540-0580-5801, 1-800-724-5801. Probably the worst kept secret in the media is that I am famous or infamous for arriving just moments before a show. Today wasn't too bad. I got here two minutes before the show. Anyway, Bill, we have you on. Uh, yeah. I don't know, and, and so people are, are kind of riveted trying to follow this. And, and, and for selfish purposes, one of the things, you know, when I was reading your article that I found really interesting is that Kathleen Kane's attorneys were denied the ability uh, to mention the porno email, essentially, to mention yeah, yeah. That, that, that this was <laughs> retaliation. In fact, if, if your article is correct, the judge told her uh, defense team if they mentioned the pornographic right. emails, they would be cited for contempt. Yeah, and and just to step back a little bit, the judge was a woman named uh, Wendy Dimchek Alloy, who is a Montgomery County judge. She was appointed earlier this year by the president judge of Montgomery County. Well, who was she? She was a former assistant district attorney in the Montgomery County District Attorney's Office. She was a prosecutor. Right. And, you know, she just seemed all through the trial like a super prosecutor. She wasn't trying to be impartial. And she basically gutted Kane's defense. And the big decision, after she ruled that Kane couldn't have, uh, you know, an outside judge or an outside jury, she, she, she said that they couldn't mention the porno email scandal or her lawyers would be hit with contempt of court. And, in fact, in the opening statement, her lawyers started to say that Kane, that Kane came into office and was investigating Jerry Sandusky. Suddenly the judge... Uh, ruled everybody had to get back into her chambers, and they came out, and they were no longer even allowed to talk about Jerry Sandusky. Well, let, let me ask you this, because I think in legal terms, is this called the motivational defense? Right. Okay. Right. Ex explain that to our viewers, because I was trying to wrestle with what that concept is. My presumption is it means this was the motivation for the prosecution. Right. In other words, if, if you take away a motivational defense, if, if you're a battered woman or you're defending yourself in self-defense, if you're not allowed to talk about what your motivations were, it, the trial is just going to come down to, did you aim the gun? Did you pull the trigger? So what about your excuse? You're guilty. So that's basically what we have here. But, but and, it, 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 you know, just an observation. It seems like everybody involved in this trial is either a prosecutor or a former prosecutor. Right. Yeah, that's what a reader said. They didn't know who to root for because they're all prosecutors. <laughs> well, to me, the important thing here is this, is that the process is sacrosanct. And if, if they strip Kathleen Kane of her ability to defend herself, um, that means it can happen to anybody. She was the attorney general, Bill. I mean, you know, people should not be celebrating her conviction if her conviction was acquired by essentially uh, amputating her defense. Right. And, I mean, you have to give Kane credit. I did not hear once. You, you hear a lot of judges or other uh, elected officials going to trial saying, if this could happen to me, it could happen to you. Well, they did this to the attorney general of Pennsylvania, folks. Right. You know, and, and so what we're discussing is whether all these things accumulated, the pretrial publicity, the courts in Montgomery County, the inability of her to mount a, a serious defense, 
whether it amounted to her being railroaded. Right. So in my mind, watching it, it reminded me of those, it's called an elimination card trick, where a card shark will make you think you're selecting of your own free will these piles of cards, but actually it's the guy who's dealing the cards that's making the decision. Mm -hmm. So that's basically what happened here at this trial. And it, and it was terrible. I mean, you know, Kane didn't put a single witness on the stand, and she didn't get up and defend herself, which was probably a mistake. Mm. But, you know, the, you know, the bottom line is it, it, it was pathetic. If she had been allowed to defend herself with the porno emails, just imagine you'd have two perhaps state Supreme Court retired justices in there. You'd have other prosecutors involved with that. So it's unclear if the jury would have been swayed, but they certainly would have realized that there was much more to what was going on here than what the prosecution and the judge were putting before them. Yeah, but, I mean, the location and the timing is, is, is intentional, and it basically diminishes the amount of coverage. And how long did it take the jury to convict her? It was four hours. Okay, so that's rather quick. So what happens next? There's a, a sentencing phase? There's a sentencing phase, and... You know, I should tell the listeners that, only, you know, immediately the judge came back after a conviction mm -hmm. and suggested that Kane might be a flight risk, and, and she threatened to put her in jail if there was any hint of retaliation. And in my mind, that meant if any of these emails get out, you're going to go to jail fast and hard, you know? Well, then what happens to the emails? I mean, th there's a couple questions here. I, I yeah. mean, what can yeah. Kathleen Kane get? Uh, he, he, here's, here's my problem is everybody, not everybody, but people say, oh, my God, you know, she was awful. She did this. I, I actually thought she was not a good pick to be attorney general, but she won the election. Um, obviously, she made errors in numerous other places. This, to me, the trial itself was flawed. And the verdict and the sentence um, are what they are. Is, is there any sense that she'll appeal? And do you have any sense what the actual punishment will be? Well, uh, her sentencing, I think, is in October. Right. And they're almost certain to appeal, but the problem with the state court is they're going to put in an appeal to the same people that turned down the earlier pretrial appeal. Right. You know, the same. So, obviously, she has to go to federal court. Some lawyers are saying that she should have gone to federal court much earlier no. and use that as a means to drag all these guys in. Well, but, again, the Shepard case was finally won in federal appeal before the U.S. Supreme Court. Well, the, the Shepard case, my goodness, you're really going back in time. I mean, well, that, that, and, 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 I, and, I, and I do remember the coverage was sensational, but that was, that was I don't recall it in retrospect as a child. But now we've gotten to the point where the attorney general has been removed. So answer me this. Right. Why are House Republicans trying to impeach somebody who's no longer in office? Yeah, well, I mean, it's just crazy. And they're saying they're doing it in case that she'll, she'll get off on appeal. They're saying, they, you know, it's the only mechanism they have to prevent her from ever running for office again. But you know what? If she wins on appeal, that means she's not guilty. So what are they doing impeaching her? All right, let's, let's yeah. come back. Yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, I think, to me, it's a waste <laughs> of money from people who, who basically don't want to waste, waste taxpayer money. Yeah, so <laughs> you know, I, I don't get it. Well, Eric Epstein in for Ken, Ken Matthews with Bill Kiesling. We'll have him till the end of the hour. WHP 580, the number is 5400 We'll be right back. All right, we're back. Eric Epstein in for Ken Matthews. We have Bill Kiesling until 5.30. Then you got me for the rest of the day, 540 1-800-724-5801, 1-800-724-5801. Again, if, you know, if, we have an iHeartRadio app, and we also have, obviously, you can go to News Radio WHP 580, but if you missed any of the shows, and I know one of the callers early on had talked about missing part of it, um, we do have podcasts, uh, and uh, the podcast can be accessed to Ken Matthews at WHP580.com. Obviously, a lesson learned today was that people really want to weigh in on the immunization issue. So I don't know when, but uh, we will get back to that issue at some point this fall. Um, it's kind of hard logistically to get guests on. So we'll do that. And uh, the Department of Health has already emailed me their uh, article they referred to, but it'll probably be tomorrow until I get that on. So um, I want to thank Dr. Robinson for doing that. Let me get to the phones real quick. Andrew, are you there? Yeah, I'm still here. Go ahead, yes. bud. Oh, uh, yeah, thanks for taking my call, and uh, I was listening, obviously, to the commentary between you and the Penn Live writer. Right. It almost seems like 
how can I say this? You're defending Kathleen Kane in many ways, or mm -hmm. saying she got an unfair trial. Yes. Am I hearing? Okay. Yeah, wow. I, but but I'm also the guy that 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 thought she was not competent to be uh, attorney general, and I'm also the guy who who thought she mishandled the Turnpike case, and I'm also the guy who thought she shouldn't have spent 181 thousand dollars on transporting herself, and I'm also the guy who didn't think she should spend campaign funds or have 300 thousand dollars defending herself. But I'm the guy who's saying what's most important is the process. The process. So the, you're saying that she had an unfair trial, but yes. her defense put up virtually no defense. Right, I mean, well, she had these high-priced lawyers. Well, let me, have the, let me yeah. have the guy who covered it. He's actually not Penn sure. Live. He was from another. He, oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Let me have Thank him you. respond to that. Yeah, sure, Andrew. Go ahead. Uh, Bill? Well, I think what we're saying is she wasn't allowed to put on a defense. <laughs> she, she was told that her lawyers would be held in contempt and sent to jail if they raised the issue of the porno emails. You know, there's that phrase, tell it to the judge. We all have a story. You should be able to go to court and give your explanation. She was denied that. So what could her defense be? You okay. know? So, so I, no I defense? I mean, she a, didn't even have to call one witness or <laughs> cross-examine the, uh, the other witnesses? I mean, that's... That's sort of absurd for Well, Andrew, for but, but, but let's go back. So, so basically the witnesses, and, and I think Bill was pointing this out, the one witness was a political consultant who had defended her until just moments before the trial and then got immunity. And what I'm saying and what I've said before is that the judicial system in Pennsylvania is a train wreck. Regardless of how you feel about Kathleen Kane, we're all entitled to due process. And this trial was over, in my opinion, if you just ask me, it was over before it began when you were stripped of, of defenses. So, yeah, I, I mean, you know, you could argue about the strategy. I, it wouldn't have been my strategy. But by the same time, I'm the same guy who don't think Bill Dewey should have defended himself in court. You know, we, we can argue all about that. The, the, the point that I'm trying to make is whether you like Kathleen Kane or not, and I have strong opinions, is the process is what's paramount. And, Bill, I, 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 because I, I don't think you covered it for Penn Live. Just re remind us who you covered it for. I covered it for NewsLank, which right. is a website in Lancaster. That's NewsLank, L-A-N-C, as Lancaster. So you can go and read the article. But, I mean, you, you raised the point about the Shepard case being way back in history. It's really not. His trial was in 55. He was put out of jail in 1966, okay, with a landmark decision. And I would just say pretrial publicity has changed an awful lot since the 50s and 60s. Now we have Twitter. We've got the Internet. We had all that stuff with Cain being impeached and, and, and all the stuff that the court did. So it's a different sort of pretrial publicity. But what's important, the other thing that happened in the mid-60s was Pennsylvania Shield Laws, which the Inquirer and the Daily News and these other newspapers, Penn Live and the Allentown Call, are flaunting. So, Eric, you actually, because you work for a, a broadcast station, you would have Shield Law protection. A blogger doesn't. So, obviously, these protections have to be widened. What the Inquirer and the Daily News and these guys who are flaunting it are doing, they're risking shield law protections for everybody. In fact, one of the grand jury recommendations was that some of these protections should be rolled back because of the mishandling of all this. I mean, they just do it while they're laughing, well, you know, it, putting out all these leaks, and then they're protected. Andrew, I guess the, the issue for me is not Cain, but the process. And, you know, what I find ironic and, you know, almost – uh, epically uh, uh, paradoxical is that she's convicted of leaks, but during this trial, th th there are more leaks than there are in a broken sprinkler system. You know, yeah, and then, and then also, I mean, the image that kept going through my mind, when you prevent somebody from giving a defense, whatever that defense is, it reminded me of how women are stoned in places in the Middle East. I mean, they bury you up to your neck, and you can't even hold out your arms to defend yourself. Well, well, Andrew, I wouldn't go that far. Here, here, here's, yeah, the, you know, here's, here's the issue. Obviously, now I see with the position where the where he's coming from, yeah. and it's it's. Now, my position is this, and it's been the same position throughout my career, is that she was entitled to a trial. I don't know why her attorneys did not. Uh, put her on the stand. I, I would suspect this, Andrew, that if she thought that the system was askew, you don't really want to aggravate the person who's going to sentence you. That would be my sober analysis. You know, I viewed her rise and fall, and if you go to our website, I've been very critical of her. But I've probably been more critical of the judicial system since my experience with the pay raise, Andrew. Yes, and, now that I can agree. But in her case, you know, she got more than a fair trial, in my, in my opinion, and, and many others. Well, she I did. mean, yeah, that's true. Yeah. So, well, you know what? Our, our Constitution isn't to protect the majority. It's to protect 
the minority, <laughs> you know. And, uh, I, you know, th- this goes back to Bud Dwyer in the <laughs> 1980s. He killed himself. I think we'd all agree that he shouldn't have been mixed up in that whole CTA scandal. But that said, he shouldn't have been ruined and tried in the newspapers, and he shouldn't have been hounded into suicide. Well, so th- that's the stuff that's going on in Pennsylvania. I don't know, Andrew, if you saw, I just wrote an op-ed with Jeff Coleman, who's uh, very conservative, on um, how we handle political prisoners. I don't know if you saw it, um, but if you go to Penn Live and Google it, you can see where my frustration is coming from, that I've been involved with convicting people that have gone awry of the law mostly politicians, and yet it, it, the disease is... I, Andrew, you can disagree with me, but I think mm-hmm. the system is more corrupt than ever. Judicial, legislative, executive... I, I, don't, I don't think we move the ball forward. So part of my frustration is, and, and, I, and I've said this and I'll continue to say, is I'm not defending Kathleen Kane. I'm defending the system. I just want to make sure we all get a fair shake. Um, I think it would have been really hard, if not impossible, for her to get a fair shake, uh, given you know everything that's surrounding her. And some of that, Andrew, obviously is her fault. Um, but I think the best thing to do is perhaps read the article um, or go to our website and, and see what our perspective is. Uh, but I, I don't think this case, Andrew's over. I'm sure it's going to linger for a, a while. Um, I, I, I don't really understand, Andrew, why people want to now impeach somebody who's no longer in office. That just blows my mind. No, well, then, no, actually, it, to me, that does make sense because yeah. if she is somehow, like I said, uh, on appeal or even pardoned, I mean, God forbid. Um, then she can uh, run again, and to seal that off completely and protect the whatever citizens are, that she tried to go into political office again somewhere. I mean, she absolutely deserves not to have any sort of. Well, that, to, to me, that's an extreme stance because if you're going to be consistent, then we need to do that against the Supreme Court justices. Right. And, and, and I mean, I, now, here's, here's where I'm at. For, We've got to be this consistent. Porn, supposed porn gate thing? I mean, first you know, of all, A, it's not really porn, it's just some bad humor. But of course, she blows it out of proportion. And then it just, it's a distraction. It's all it really was. Well, now I see well, where you, Andrew, now I see where you're coming from because, in my, my opinion, you have to be consistent. So whether it's Bob Mello or some, and all these guys, or but, and all these guys. sister. How about that? Yeah, absolutely. So we can go but again. But, but again, if I could throw in, it's not about the porn. It wasn't about the content of the emails. It was the conflict of interest in the ex parte communications between right. the judge and the prosecutors who are also involved in her prosecution. I don't want so, my I don't want my defender and my prosecutor and my judge having a chuckle a thon. Yeah. And if we're talking about consistency, where the where the heck? Are these other uh, investigations now about all these other leaks? There, there, there aren't any. So you're holding Kane to a different standard than everyone else is being held to. All right, Bill, we're okay. gonna we're gonna have to say goodbye. And, right. Andrew, uh, thanks for thanks for calling in. I appreciate your opinion, Bill. Thank thanks you. for weighing in. Uh, obviously, what you were a provocateur, uh, out, <laughs> outstanding as usual. We'll talk to you soon. I'll be back in a minute. We're gonna change <laughs> subjects yet again. We're 50 days out from the election, 50 days, and we just have wonderful choices in November. So let's chat about that in just a moment. Eric Epstein and. For Ken Matthews.